you know, you, the conservation part is very important. You mentioned that in the story of, of with your grandfather and the lake that was built around your home and um, how you learned about how that, uh, you know, was beneficial to the environment and, and wildlife around that area. And you've made conservation sort of like the key uh, mission uh, for you in your life. Uh, every time I've been around you, it's, you mention it in every speech, in every conversation. Um, try to help people that are listening understand why that is so important to you and why it's so critical to, um, to our future. Thank you. So, yeah, I feel so blessed in my life uh, to be around the outdoor industry. It all comes around the quality of fishing and hunting in one, one aspect. We benefited from it, so it's our obligation to give back. One thing's all, but also it's a shared passion. A lot of people in our company realize this. And you came up to the Fish and Wildlife Museum. One of the main missions there, and I think we have, is to share the story of the role that sportsmen and women play in conservation. Since the days of Roosevelt and Audubon, they were they were hunters, they were outdoorsmen. And through being connected to nature, being in the field or on a stream, they understood the importance more of habitat, of regulations to ensure healthy populations of fish and wildlife. A lot of people aren't aware of this, but over 80% of the funding for all the state fishing, fish and wildlife agencies come from sportsmen and women. They are derived from the sale of hunting and yes. fishing license, mm -hmm. but also most people aren't aware of this, and I'm proud to just share it with everybody that's listened to this uh, podcast. <clears throat> There's a 10% federal excise tax that sportsmen and women lobbied for that's collected on the sale of every fishing, all fishing equipment, uh, firearms, ammunition, most hunting supplies, 10 to 11% is collected at the federal level and it's remitted back to the states based on a formula. So between licenses and that federal tax, sportsmen and women are paying a huge amount of the funding for conservation in America, and it impacts you know all of North America in many instances beyond that. So I just think, uh, and and it's uh, what I call common sense conservation, and not just extreme mm -hmm. uh, yeah. things. And uh, so anyway, those are I think passions we share where we came from. Last year was our 50th anniversary, and we shared in our catalog for the first time. The last decade, we've averaged giving back 10% of our earnings back to conservation. That's something that all of us in the company are very proud of. But I think we look at it, too, like NASCAR. It's an investment, you know, for our business, for the future, for the future of the sports we love, but also for the future of our company. Yeah. I've had the chance to um, see a lot of the the conservation, the work that you've done, and I would encourage anybody listening to to, to – check it out look it up but and we won't we don't have the opportunity to talk about every single thing but i've been to big cedar lodge i've been to um, dogwood canyon national park which is just amazing um and uh just you, you know big cedars there at table rock lake um if people were to just go there and just see the massiveness of what you have preserved and kept and done uh, the museum there i mean it's just incredible you have that big mammoth while woolly was a woolly mammoth yeah, is that what yeah, it yeah. Is? um and just i mean it's just absolutely incredible when you go there and that's when i that's when i knew could see it for the importance of all of that it's just crazy so the story i heard <clears throat> you were building you have this resort yeah i, I want right? to go i want to talk about that that um so you think <laughs> you have this resort that you're building is it true that you discovered some um, fossils while building the golf, building some portion of this resort? There was some discovery that you were like, oh, stop everything. Let's get the, you know, the experts in here and sort this out. Let's let this, this has got a, this is all has a process that has to play through. Am I telling this story correctly? Well, look, so we had a little irrigation lake on a golf course. It's a little place. Top of the rock, it's my, it's a beautiful view in the Ozarks, overlooks Table Rock Lake. There's a number three flag, always been Flies there. Flies every day. Yeah. So anyway, this irrigation lake, it drains out. So 
in Missouri, we have pretty, it's called karst topography or a lot of limestone. It's the, uh, it's, Missouri is also referred to as a cave state. So I'm nuts about spelunking, going in caves and looking around. <laughs> so where this little irrigation was, I go out there one morning, it's just gone. And there was a little sinkhole and the lake flushed out. It was maybe just a couple of acres. But it flushed out this cave that we found about 15 years before. So, man, I'm t- I know these places are connected. So we start digging to try to find out where the sinkhole does it lead into this cave. And we found the water when it flushed out to the other cave. So they got to be connected, whether it's through a little foxhole corridor or giant caverns. So we started digging about seven years ago, and we're still digging. You're still digging. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's amazing. We call it the cathedral of nature today. But it's like uh, geologists said it was formed like 320 million years ago. The walls Whoa. were about 250 wow. feet deep now. And we've got to figure out a tour how we get people down in there but it's it's yeah. really beautiful and don't you also have mean you have a means where people are out looking for other um relics and fossils and whatnot don't out in that area is that am i right no i just not not necessarily. Oh, but well, if, I thought some of the things from the museum were things all, f- that from were the from, area, yes. from that area. Yeah, okay, they're from got the, it. Okay, yes. so they're just so to me about that, that little museum. It's yeah. in a lot yeah. of uh, Native it's, that's American That's not artifacts, a little museum. But yeah. like, but, but <laughs> anyway, it's to pass on the heritage yeah. and like yeah. the way of life and part of it's hunting. Like I have great reverence for like Native Americans mm-hmm. and they yeah. they lived off the land. And yeah. They had to practice some conservation, right? Because yeah. and to be just have a little handmade arrowhead and a stick and they got to survive with this you know like yeah. yeah it's incredible that museum so what's the square footage of the museum well there's two there's one is to, down there atop the rock it's probably i don't know three or four thousand feet it's not giant but then the one in springfield is very large it's like a half a million or something. right so you this you opened this up a handful of years ago um it's a big fanfare. We were lucky enough to be able to go, well, thank th- you for go coming. through it. Incredible museum. Just inc- insane. Um, <clears throat> what was the... Uh, ha- all right, I know the reason why you built this, uh, but the pure cost of putting something like that together and the, the, um, <clears throat> the monumental task of uh, maintenance and upkeep and just... The whole process. I mean, I mean, it must have been a dream. You must have been thrilled to take it, take it on, right? To create this vision for the museum, but um, it must have been uh, daunting and overwhelming at the same time because it's uh, there's nothing like it. I don't think in the in the country uh, for for people that are you know that are interested in hunting and fishing and conservation, but also a bit of a history lesson on on our our land and our country i felt the timing was really right dale and kelly because we had these partners our conservation partners these groups ducks unlimited wild turkey federation all these groups on and on audubon uh so to have these relationships where they could help us create the storylines what are the messages what are the success stories that we've had in america and conservation and also what are the alarm signals or what do we need to be watching so we hope this especially for young people you got to bring island or little sister sometime come Mm -hmm. back but it's like passing on this hunting and fishing heritage and current up to speed messages about conservation so we had the conservation partners and then a group of very talented people that help us with the dioramas and the visual display in our stores and other talented people that we work with that are just freelance so we had this nucleus of people and i felt like man we got to tell this story and so it's all in a foundation and uh we chipped in on it pretty heavy and other donors but it's uh i just felt like man one thing we could do is pass on our heritage where we came from is it serving that purpose well yeah, i think so we've been having attendance over a million people a year just Damn. over a million for springfield and so uh yeah we have a classroom there for fifth graders called the wolf school and it's it's all year long but they do broadcast there and it, they go pretty much across the united states and some degree around the world 
and our conservation partners have messages and it goes out into classrooms so kids can le- learn yeah. about the environment and and That's all really kinds cool. of animals and fish. That's awesome. Yeah, if you haven't been to the museum in, in Springfield, it's a must-see. Yeah.